in Genesis chapter 22. The title of the lesson is Faith Grows in Desert Times. So kind of an oxymoron, right? You'd think not much grows in the desert, but that's the point. It takes you from, it strips you from everything that you may be going to instead of God, and now there's nothing to do but seek God and go to God and ask God to help. And uh, sometimes we need to be put in the desert in our lives because God says you're not learning any other way, or he wants us just to grow. So let's look in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Thank you for the communion, Chaz. That was awesome. Sylvia, can you believe he's even opening a Bible and reading? I'm just kidding. He's an amazing young man. I said, great job. I'm proud of you and Amy and your marriage. Uh, Travis, thank you so much for teaching us and continuing to help us see how trusting God in everything, in our giving and uh, whatever, but in our giving, God always blesses. And I could literally see Vanessa actually say that. Did I marry a brother that wants his change back? Can't, can't you see Vanessa and them having that interaction? I could see her saying that. You guys are awesome. Uh, in Genesis 22, verse 1, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said, to Abra he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took, him, took with him two servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. Why, I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac, and he, carried himself, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them... As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. God did not want Isaac to die. Some people go, why did he do that? He did not want him to, buy, to, to die. You've got to understand the first verse in this chapter 22 says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. If you're going to benefit from going through a test, you must go into the situation and pass or fail in faith and trust. He did not want him to die, but he wanted Abraham to sacrifice Isaac in his heart. So it would be clear that Abraham loved God more than he loved his promised and long-awaited son. God was testing Abraham. Why? The purpose of testing is to strengthen our character and deepen our commitment to God and his perfect timing. It's not going to be your timing. It's never going to seem like it's your timing, which is a good indication you're not trusting God. 
because you're, you're actually giving up you're, or you're wanting, you're like looking at it, expect it. And now you're getting anxious. Yeah. See, through this difficult experience, Abraham strengthened his commitment to obey God. He also learned about God's ability to provide. I love the theme. There's so many themes in this. But I love how even when he asked, when he was on that mountain, when he was told to go do what he was going to do, is three days. And he, was, had to, he had to hold himself together before his son. Not knowing what's going to happen, but knowing I'm going to obey this command that really seemed totally out of context and not seemingly like it would come from the God he's known. In fact, God had given him Isaac and promised that Isaac, this would be where he, all the offspring would go. And this was a beautiful gift of faith as well, tested. So he's going, you know, so, so when, when. You know, the, 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 the intensity in this conversation in verse 7 and 8, you got to realize what was going on in Abraham, how he was holding himself together emotionally, yeah. his makeup, emotional makeup. Because yeah. Isaac even spoke up. So we know he wasn't like a little kid. He was a boy allowed to converse. He, we know that he was strong enough to carry things. Yeah. And... He spoke up to Abraham in verse 7 and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham said, replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? So really, he's like genuinely going, did we forget? He has no clue and nor would he even go to that thought of what God said. Where's the, where, do we forget the offering? Abraham answered, and this is the answer that there was no, he answered out of no clue and still in the anguish of obeying God. There was no answer. There was no hint. There was no change. And he says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. See, how well you know God shows how well you are under pressure. See, you don't know God if you break and split. Immaturity is exposed faithfully on how you react under fire and pressure and challenges. If you don't obey and you throw tantrums or you check out emotionally, God will still help you out of it. But why aren't you growing? Because God says he will provide. So Abraham knew God enough already that knowingly this was, I'm sure, he was questioning, possibly wondering, confused, this can't be God. Yeah. All those things. Yeah. And the reason he did this was to make sure that not even children come before him, us and God. Even your own children, which they can become idols. Yeah. They're a gift from God, but if you love your children and you're devoted more to children than God, you're off. Yeah. Come on. Come on. This was a blessing, a longing. They thought they couldn't have children. They had Isaac, and now he's saying a sacrifice yeah. because it was so important to them. But he proved in the test that he was going to be obedient moment to moment. He understood the big picture, but he just knew in obedience, you can't see the full picture with God when you're obeying, when it's hard, when it's tough, when you don't feel like it, when in your sinful makeup's calling you the other way, when you're confused, or all kinds of things, anything that you could think of is going down. Yeah. You need to obey moment to moment and quit looking at the big picture. That's why Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. So he was obeying and having a conversation and said, the Lord will provide. You don't need to know how you're going to get out of something, except you know God is with you. And it may not turn out the way you want. And some of us have avoided pain so much that God's going to allow pain to come into your life because that's what you're so avoidance of. You're so in your life, maybe you, have, you need to get tougher. So don't get afraid of God, but everything is for what? Strengthen your commitment to God and deepen and strengthen your character as a human being. You can't 
hold it together in small times, how are you going to hold it together in hard times, big times? On, he whose strength, he who falters with little trials shows how little their strength is. Mm. Point number one is desert moments teach reliance on God. Desert moments teach reliance on God. And I love the GNN video where they were giving our brother Kip a, a happy birthday and congratulations. I love how his wife Elena shared the greatest quality for Kip was resilience. Yeah. Fortitude, he said, fortitude. That is in hard times. He's been faithful 50 years. I know Kip very well, and I know just as any one of us would go through behind the scenes what has happened in his life and his family and challenges and pain and where he was in the darkest of times at times. He never gave up. It's beautiful to see someone, and you and I can show that to God, and then that shows to people. Yes. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. We're looking under point number one. Desert moments teach reliance on God. Because only faith can grow when you're tested. It's easy to come through and do everything when everything's handed to you and nothing's wrong. It's now you need to see, are you going to be strong enough to be righteous? Amen. So it says here in Philippians 4, because see, Abraham, I think, could have wrestled with this. See, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, even when I'm thinking that I'm going to have to kill and sacrifice my son. Wow. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, request we present your request to God. Well, he presented it to Isaac saying, the Lord will provide. Amen. And we don't know, but I know Abraham was, a, was the father of faith with God. So you know he was meditating and thinking and, 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 go, and wondering and probably praying in between to keep his composure to not freak his son out. Yeah. Verse 7 says, in the peace after you pray about every situation when you have anxiety, right? It says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, the first thing a person can kind of say when they're really, really in a hard time and someone tries to comfort them, you don't understand, which can be true. We don't need to understand. That's not our job as a human being. I don't need to understand your pain, but I can still say I'm here to comfort you, and I don't have the answers, but I care. That's all we can do. We don't need to have to fix people, nor can we. Because God says this. Well, no matter what you're going through, and I, this is a true scripture. If, if you're a true, faithful Christian, you've dealt with this. I can tell you over 28 years I've learned to do this. And it comes through. Maybe not in my timing. Peace of God. That's what, when you say you don't understand, well, the peace of God does. And the peace of God says, well, which transcends what? All understanding. So if you say no one understands, well, you haven't gone to God. Because God says, I will transcend my peace into all understanding, no matter what's going on. And I'm going to guard your heart and minds from what? Disobeying God, breaking trust, and going into more anxiety, which will break trust. Anxiousness leads to foolish thoughts and emotional, really stupid decisions. Because anxiousness and emotional uh, lack of control leads to going and being led by your emotions and feelings and not your faith and conviction. That's why Jesus prayed when he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death because he wasn't, he, he goes, Father, help me to go to the cross and die. If, it's, if you're willing, take this cup from me, but not as I will, but as you will. Because he was emotionally struggling and he had emotions, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That's, anxi that's anxiousness, that's sorrow, that's all that coming down. And that's normal. You're going to have that. Yeah. See, examples would be, simple examples would be, I lost my wallet two days ago. <laughs> or yeah, right before I picked up Sonia. I was actually getting ready to go to the airport, and I couldn't find my wallet. So that I had to get to the airport, but I couldn't find my wallet. So I grabbed my spare wallet that I lost before, I thought, and it... <laughs> I lost my wallet before and went and replaced and changed my credit cards, my license and everything, and then we found that wallet. So I agree, it's a little spare. 
but I didn't have a duplicate license. All I had was another ID, so I had to put that in my pocket. But I had, so I just took, I hope if a cop pulled me over, I'd say I lost my wallet. What I was proud of, though, is once I lost the wallet, I prayed. See, you might think, well, that's not that big of a deal. No, anytime you want to get anxious, and I don't know about you, if I lose a wallet, i got to grab my thoughts because I'll get anxious. And then I went, God, help me be calm. And then I got to a point where I was praying, and I was so encouraged that I was proud of myself. And then I went, oh, I better not be too prideful because I don't want to start bragging. (laughs) Because I started to go, wow, I am so proud of myself. I didn't even care I lost my wallet. In fact, I already went to fast forward that God will provide. It doesn't even matter. And then once I thought... What do I really need to do? Oh, I went online and locked my credit cards, which I didn't know you could do that. So I didn't even have to cancel them yet. I go, now, I'm, now everything's locked. Yeah. And then I said, what's the big deal? I live about, what, three blocks from the driver's license place? Yeah. And then I, I just thought through, no matter what, I don't need it back. I just need to be calm and I need to be with God says, no matter what happens, pray. So I did that. And, and I was calm and I picked up Sonia, didn't even say anything. She goes, you're weak. And I said, oh, yeah, I lost my wallet. Yeah, but I said, you know, I, I'm a big deal. I mean, that's weird. You know when you've lost something like that, you get stressed. But then I went, what am I stressed about? It's ridiculous. And I prayed, and I realized this will happen in any situation. I prayed in this situation when I was in the hospital as a quadriplegic. I wasn't going to get anxious. I just stepped moment to moment. I didn't know what would happen. The doctors didn't know. They didn't tell me how far I'd go. I still have a ways to go. I have lots of things. I mean, I'm walking, but I have lots of complications. It doesn't matter. I told Sonia, I go, I can't believe what he did and what I've learned through it. Now I have a quality, and he allowed me to even come to this point where I have a quality of life where I'm so grateful if nothing ever happens. I'm grateful now that I walk kind of like a uncoordinated robot. I can't be a dancer. I'm kind of, you know, with the cane and even off, I look like I am going to get you. I don't care. I am coordinated and functional enough that I love my quality of life. I go, God, you didn't have to do that. I could have been in a wheelchair for those rest. So I don't care if I get nothing else. I go, wow. And whatever was happening, it didn't matter. I surrendered in the hospital. Like, even when I thought I was going to die, before they got to it, I, I couldn't breathe. My breath, I just said, God, I just searched my heart. Is there sin I haven't been with? I said, this is it. I talk about death. I didn't know. But I was surrendered, and the anxiety was gone. It's great to be in those moments. It's scary, but then it's awesome. Because if you're a true disciple, you're just going to go to God. But are you going to God now in your daily walk? Stephen Hill, man of God, proud of him. Stephen and Leandra, I love their hearts because they not only are they, are they Bible talk leaders, but they have, and they open their home for the uh, even greater things, Bible talk, led by Chaz and Amy, but they are homeowners. And, I, and Stephen was very subdued, and I could relate to him, and I, I said, hey, bro, are you okay on the Bible talk? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And I said, what's going on? And he was just calm, and I said, and he said, I don't know if the AC's working. And I could see new homeowner, AC. So I went, bro, I can relate. I'm 60 and I owned, uh, I bought and sold houses and I had a company that before when I, was out of the, when I wasn't in the ministry uh, and I had at one time investment properties where every summer in Arizona had come and I realized the properties I owned, I had six ACs that could go out. So every summer I, as a disciple, I was like, and I told him about the AC prayer. Because if an AC goes out, it's like 2,500 bucks it could be. If you don't have, and I went six. God, <laughs> what's the point? With blessings comes more. Nothing satisfies. If you, nothing wrong with prospering, but you understand. And he handled it well. I don't know. Is your AC working? Yeah. Amen. All right. <laughs> well, and, but I'm not making fun of him. They, they, have, to, they have to pray because, you, you know, you, you, anything that great can happen and then something else happens and then you go from joy to going, oh, no. Yeah. What, what do you think? That's what it's about. It's never going to change. That's the life. Trials are going to come. It's not about getting somewhere. Something else is going to happen. That's God's design because he loves you. He wants you to grow in faith, not, you know, your stuff. So, I did. I unlocked my credit cards, which is a new feature I didn't know. And, uh, but I already was resolved. I'm just saying it was really interesting. The, anytime you get anxious, just start praying, and it doesn't matter about the result. I already went, whoa, it's done. If a car breaks down, so anything, anything, even health, anything, you just got to go, God will provide. And if he's meaning to provide you, it's time to go to heaven, that's fine too. Amen. 
Or if you're not sure where you are, then you should get scared to death if you're, and, and go, I need to seek God. They should put that on your heart because if you're not living obedient to God the way the scriptures define, and you think you're right with God, that's insane. And I'm not the judge. No one's the judge here. But the Bible says you, the, the, there is a judge for me and my words. That very words I spoke will condemn you on my last day. That's John 12, 48. So anyone is not opening the Bible to understand the true God and what God wants, you can't just think you're winging it. That's really wrong because you're sinful by nature. And Jesus did die, but you got to be in touch with it and be walking the way Jesus says to follow. See, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So true Bible faith is confident obedience to God's word, despite circumstances or consequences. How fast do you get back into a peaceful disposition? How fast do you, are you able to resolve something with someone if you're hurt or offended? That shows who you are with God. See, we're all needing to crucify our sins and continue to reevaluate is Jesus Lord and is God's mighty kingdom and God enough? Because you've already, if you are a Christian, you've been given eternal life. So faith, this faith operates quite simple. God speaks in his word. We hear his word when we read it. We trust his word and act on it no matter what the circumstances are to what or what the consequences may be. We trust God's word and act on it no matter what the circumstances are or what the consequences may be. That's why when we read the Bible, people say, you know, they get, they get stoned to death. They get killed because they don't renounce. That's faith. Dying. Point number two is true faith is risky faith. And I don't mean it's risky, you're taking a risk, but at first when you start to grow in your testings, when you're in testing, that's where you're challenged because you wouldn't have a challenge or wrestling with it, wrestling with faith, right? Wrestling with grace from God, unless it seemed risky. It shouldn't seem risky because God provides and promises, even though we know, but we still have to get to know God better. It's not us. We just are keep going, God, I don't know if I trust you. That's what we're really saying, even though we would never say that. But that's how we're acting because God is impossible to lie. It says that. So... Hebrews 11, verse 17, true faith is risky faith. What, what's a risk? Any kind of investment takes a risk, even if it's a good investment and you've done all your homework. There's still a risk. There's never a guarantee. Someone says, oh, wow, I got a connection. My buddy gave me this, told me to do this or that. It's going to be, and you're like, we're going to make money. There's no guarantee. Anytime you invest for a return, just understand there's always a risk. In life and investments with faith it's not a risk because God promises everything in his time but it seems like a risk to us otherwise we wouldn't be struggling and it says in verse 17 by faith Abraham when God tested him offered Isaac as a sacrifice he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son even though God had said to him it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead because he made the decision fully when God said, go sacrifice your son, even though that sounds morbid, he was going to do it. That's, he was, and see, in the world today, those who don't follow the Bible, we can be called cult members or weird or whatever, because we obey God, and it's very different from the world's pattern of the world. You obey God's word and the plan for your life, and then the plan of what Jesus says the church is. Abraham obeyed God by faith when he did not understand how God was working. That's the challenge. See, you and me, when we struggle, our heartbeat goes up, which, cause, which is called anxiety which is sin. The Bible says, do not be anxious for anything. Well, we're going to be anxious. We're, do not worry. Jesus commands it. Some people think it's an option. Jesus says, do not worry about your life. That's, he's telling you not to do that. So when you worry, in essence, you're in sin, which means we're covered by grace. Because why do we worry? I, I, even though I can preach this, I'm going to still struggle with that at times. Isn't that hilarious? 
He says, don't worry about your life. And what Chaz was saying, I love the scripture where it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he says, I'll give you anything. And why do we worry? Because we're sinners. And we still don't trust. And we still think there's risks when things happen. Until you can go, let it go, let God. Or you can go, poor me. And now you don't have God. Because when you go, poor me, that's not trusting God. Did you know that? It's not trusting God when you go, oh, poor me, and you have self-pity. Yeah. If you have fear, that's not trusting God. God's still going to work with you. Yeah. But he's got to wait for you to get out of it. See, once you get stopped in your sin, the issue is, are you going to come out of it God's way or sin? Then if you fail, you can come back and repent, but you're not moving forward. God's going to bring another situation, different, maybe same dog, different fleas, sin-wise. You're never going to grow until you grow. So the same scenarios are going to keep throwing at you. Maybe you keep going, why do I get anxious? Why do I get angry? Why do I get stressed? Why do I get impure? Why do I do this? Because you're not passing the tests. And God's grace will keep throwing at you. You're never going to go to the next level until you take the pain in obedience and go, wow. And then in hindsight, you go, I grew. You can't grow till you take the pain. Mentally, emotionally, and physically. You can't grow until you realize, I will die for Jesus. Literally mean that. And he doesn't expect you to get there right away. He's going to work with you, but you must grow. Look in 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6. See, why would God want Abraham to sacrifice his son when it was the Lord who had given him that miracle child? That could go through his mind. I know it goes through our mind. Like, what? That's such an out-of-context scripture. Even today when I read it, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. But God allowed it. That's why I realized the God, word of God is so true. Why would they put things like that in it if, they, if someone's trying to uh, uh, you know, deceive us and say it's, it's just a book written by men? They wouldn't put that. All of the future nation's promises were wrapped up in Isaac from God's promise to Abraham. Yet now he's telling to kill and put to death all the promises. That would make God not only contradictory, but it would make God a flat-out liar. The tests of faith become more difficult as we walk with God. Yet the rewards become more wonderful. You start to look at trials and challenges finally as, oh, great, another opportunity for great joy. Instead of going, oh, no. See, that's where you get through the baby stages of Christianity. Now you realize it's always designed, even though you can avoid trials and challenges, by learning to be more wise and, dis and uh, d self-disciplined and have character and not be la do things that you know are destroying you. You can change all that eventually, but then trials and challenges are now, wow, amen, God. What am I going to grow in on this? On. See, that's the goal, to grow. And that's why God doesn't make it harder, but that's the more blessings, because the more challenging that you can handle it, the more heavenly you become on earth. Amen. So understand, look at the tests Abraham's going through right now, and he's already been amazing before. The tests of faith become more difficult as we walk with God, yet the rewards become more wonderful. Amen. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly also reaps sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. That's a fact. It's not saying question. And they're using the, 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 the example of throwing seeds to grow. If you throw more seeds out, you're going to have a great harvest. Everybody knows that. Now he's talking about giving. Each one of us, verse 7, should decide what you decide, should give what you decide in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things and at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. This is another faith issue. You know, when I was doing the lesson today, I told Sonia, we, you know, we, we plan what we're doing as a goal for special, and we don't just have it, like, in satchels under our bed. Grab the satchel out. It's time to just throw that money we don't use to special. But we chunk it. And I said, honey, let's give another chunk. Dink, 
sent the little finger, boom, 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 sent it this morning. And I realized things are feeling, you know, I'm feeling good, but I'm still feeling, but I'm feeling good. But, you know, when you give money, it's like, mm, and then I realized it's faith. It's amazing to read about faith because I'm not doing it as I guarantee anything back, but I'm giving it because I believe that's God's plan to make disciples of all nations. And God could do it anyway, but he says he gives through faith. And it's not about your money. And just believe me, if you think you're giving money to church, keep your stinking money because I don't want it and God doesn't either. I don't need your money. I was, I was in the movement. I was asked to come here and take the leadership of the church. I've been leading churches way longer. You're not doing squat for me. I'm, I serve God just like you serve God, right? You hear what I'm saying? I'm just Joe Disciple that's been asked to be Joe Evangelist. So I stepped into it and said, I don't know, God, help me. I'm trying. Paul's final reflection on giving is about faith. And I'm not hitting giving again, but I'm showing this is so tangible because it's a promise. It says this is another area of your faith. Give back. God's going to work through your faith on giving sacrificially. Do you trust? See, if you don't give sacrificially, it's not about the money. It's like God's going, you're going, I don't trust. It's risky. See, and he says, you know what? Don't do it until you get your heart right. Don't give unreluctantly. I need you to be cheerful. But then he says, God is able to bless you abundantly. You, 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 but see, we struggle with that. We don't see that. Look at that in verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. I mean, how many promises are in that one little verse? All bless you abundantly. Not just bless you a little bit. Hey, thanks for giving back to God. Thanks for sacrificing. Here's a little tidbit. He says abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. So as a disciple, you realize it's not about gaining things, but God's going to throw things at you materially, financially, because it's a platform to fly with God serving on earth. It's not like, I need this. It's like, oh, I got so much. Now eventually you've grown so much. It's like, how do I, how do I get advice to be generous? Yeah. That's where you're at when you really understand it's not about, oh, no, my poor money. I made my budget. You're still struggling. That's fine. Struggle. But struggle up, man. Get over it and grow. Struggle up. It's time to crank out our missions. In May, we got to get it. And I commend everybody. We've done it every year. I call everybody by faith to reach in and do your best. Our goal is to give to the movement, to give these, these church plantings for souls, 75 grand. Amen. I appeal to you to reach inside yourself and pray and look at the Bible and then do as a disciple would do. Yes. Go for it. The raffle tickets, those of you, is not about God making you struggle. It's about being an effort to make it happen. And everybody needs to participate as a disciple if we're really going to hit the goal God gave us. Yeah. Awesome. Last point coming in for landing, true faith is all of God or none of God. Do you hear me? The only biblical faith is all of God or none of God. Most people miss this. Many people in America go, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I go to a church. They don't have a clue at times about what discipleship means. They weren't taught. It's not their fault. I wasn't taught. I went to church for a long time and grew up, and I didn't realize what, and I didn't even get answers. I never looked for answers, but no one really sat me down like, and studied and go, let me answer your questions and show you the Bible and teach you what I've learned from Jesus. Just as though Jesus came to me at a lake and said, hey, Chris, come follow me, but I'm gonna, you're going to watch. That's what you do in the Bible. You look, what's that mean? And he goes, come follow me. Yeah. And Mark 10, 28. Mark 10, 28. True faith is all of God or none of God. And see, that's grace. Because even as disciples, we say Jesus is Lord. We go in the water, and God's like, I know you mean well, kid. And I'm not even saying you guys didn't mean it, but when you go in, you don't really realize what you've said. Yeah. That's why people fall away from their faith because it's too risky and they don't they didn't understand jesus is lord because of your good confession just like peter said he's able to re, to baptize you all for in the name of jesus your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the holy spirit that's in acts 2 36 jesus is lord that means all of you jesus is your master of your life over everything but we don't understand, and that's why God's going, I'm going to help work with you. I mean, I know you mean well, but now let's see how you really come through, because it's all of me. 
Not because he's trying to put a hardship on you. He's trying to help you realize this isn't your life. It's not about this life. See, the whole world today says it's about this life. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It's lies. American dream, Australia dream. It's all a lie. The American dream, the American dream is a lie. If that's what you're living for, you're going to be empty. Even if you make money. What are you living for? Eternal life. Not this life, the life to come. Enjoy this life, but don't make it important. Just serve God and go through it. God's going to give you what you need. In Mark 10, 28, then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. I. Wait, Peter spoke up and said, we left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel. By the way, fields would be work. Jobs doesn't mean be a derelict, but you're not going to let your career or the time get in fear with being devoted to God and his kingdom, his church on earth. Along with persecutions. So he says, wow, all this stuff. You see what Jesus just said? After Peter said, we left everything to follow you. He said, well, you're going to lose some stuff. You may have to leave relationships, situations. But he says, guess what? You're not you're going to get a hundred times as much in this present age, not death. What? Homes? You may live different places. Brothers and sisters, that's family, more family. Doesn't negate, doesn't cut any of our blood family. We need to love them to death. But spiritual family is brothers and sisters. Look how big the family of God is. And it's not we're better than anybody, but you just know when you sit down with someone who has the true spirit of God, you can talk on the same plane deep like your heart. People, and it's not just, I didn't get it. When I realized this is a powerful opening of your eyes, you understand what people in the world don't yet. Not yet. Maybe they're not open. Like my brother, you saw my brother get baptized. I'm going to have him come and share, and then we'll put up the video of him having a high speed chase. I told him, can we do that? Because high speed chase on TV in LA, and they opened up, and it says it's the stuff. Hollywood movies are made of, and it has a helicopter, and I'm not bragging. It's very sad. He's being chased, high-speed high chase in a BMW from a burglary, and he told me he was on something, on and, and high-speed chase by about 10 cop cars. They get him in a cul-de-sac, pull out guns and everything, and it's on film, and that was it. He gave a wink to the camera, and he did 10 years for that wink. Wow. I said, was that wink worth it? And the camera came up, and he's like, half drugged out, he knows this, and he just went down, and then I didn't see him, he was in 10 years, and then he got out of prison, and finally was open after 10 years in prison, and now he seeks first the kingdom, because he, he, cause God had humbled him, realized that now he really, is 58, and he's kind of injured from being in prison, it's like God's so merciful, it's like, did it have to happen, yeah, he made choices, but now it's like, what else do I got, now he's like, I got this family, I got brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and family, he's shy, he's in LA alone, he'd be a convict down in a little shack now he's got a family of God people that love him he's like he's shocked that's the way we should be anyway Jesus assured the disciples that anyone who gives up something valuable for his sake will be repaid a hundred times do you believe that that's not risky anymore I've seen it do you see it in your life Sonia and I feel like we're the richest people in the world we've been baptized 27 years and believe me, we don't get paid. Most of you get paid. I mean, middle class salaries. Believe me, if you saw them, how you doing? We, it just happens. Stuff happens from outside. People, situations. I don't even understand it. I find beautiful red Tahoes that are 2009 mint condition, 70,000 miles, four wheel drive, off road rescue, and I love it. But it's 13 years old. Most people go, "What does he want that red car for?" For me, it's awesome. And there's only one like it. I don't see any other ones. It's an ex fire chief's car. Ex-fire chief, you can't find it. You might get an ex-cop car. I got an ex-fire chief. For me, I get it like a kid every day. I go, honey, you want me to go store and get milk? I love it. <laughs> it's like the best thing ever. Why? God changed my heart. It's not like I'm going, oh, no. No, I love it. It'd be hard if I had the cash to go get a brand new Tahoe. I go, I just don't know if I could let it go. It's, I just love it. I love the story. I love everything with it. But I think that's the way God lets me look at things. Yes. I just am grateful for everything. On, awesome. For example, Someone may be rejected by his or her family for really making Jesus Lord, but that person will gain a larger family of believers. Why they're loving that family member or family that doesn't understand still, because it's not you. You don't start loving. Jesus emphasized persecution to make sure that people do not selfishly follow him only for the rewards. There are rewards, but you can't do it for the You're doing it because Jesus died for you. So, so guys, 
wherever you're at, even if you fail in the desert, get back up, grace is there. But know the blessing of growing when it's hard is amazing. And to God be the glory.